A number of in vitro diagnostic tests are based on the specificity of interaction between antibodies and antigens. When soluble antibodies react with insoluble particles, such as bacteria, the antibodies link the bacterial cells together, forming an agglutinate. When certain viruses, such as the measles virus, are mixed with red blood cells, the virus particles react with structures on the surfaces of the red blood cells, causing hemagglutination. If the patient has measles, the serum will contain antibodies against the measles virus. If the patient's serum is mixed with measles virus and red blood cells are added, hemagglutination will not occur. Antibodies reacting with the virus particles prevent reaction between the virus and the red blood cells. Agglutination tests can also be used to measure antibody titer. In the tube test, a specific amount of antigen is added to a series of tubes. Serial dilutions of serum-containing antibody are then added to each tube. The greatest dilution of serum showing agglutination is determined, and the reciprocal of this dilution is termed the antibody titer. When soluble antigens such as proteins react with soluble antibodies, they form a precipitate. If the antigen solution is layered on top of the antibody solution in a test tube, a precipitation ring forms in the area where the two solutions make contact. The precipitin reaction also occurs when antibodies and soluble antigens are mixed in the proper proportions. The antibodies link the antigens together to form a precipitate that settles out of the solution when it becomes sufficiently large. Immunoprecipitation increases as more and more antigen is added. When the optimum ratio of antigen to antibody is present, called the equivalence zone, the maximum amount of precipitate is formed. If more antigen is added, smaller complexes and therefore less precipitate is formed. A graph of the amount of precipitate formed versus the amount of antigen added shows the amount of precipitate increasing until the zone of equivalence is reached. As the amount of antigen added becomes in excess of the antibody, the amount of precipitate decreases. So to further differentiate between the agglutination and precipitation reactions, we have this kind of definition of what agglutination is, which is that its antigens are whole cells, such as red blood cells, bacteria, or viruses displaying surface antigens. So any of those structures, because we're going to say virus is not a cell, is going to display some surface antigen and it's going to react with antibodies. Precipitation, the antigen is a soluble molecule, so it's smaller and it's soluble. But in both of these reactions, when the antigen antibody concentrations are optimal, you have lots of interlinked antigen antibody complexes, and the insoluble aggregates will settle out of solution. So while the antigen is soluble, when you have the antigen antibody complex, it is insoluble, and that will settle out of solution. Agglutination reactions can be easily seen because they consist of visible clumps of cells. And there's one type of test which is called the hemagglutination, which is where you have agglutination performed routinely by blood banks to determine ABO blood typing. And there's also the Coombs test, which is pretty much part of this. It's the same, but it's uh, the RH factor. You're looking for whether they're positive for RH or negative for RH factor. So antiserum containing antibodies is added to blood and they're mixed together and you read whether there is presence or absence of clumping will indicate whether you have the different types of blood. Um, so if you have no A nor B, then that would be an O type blood. If you have both A and B, that would be AB. And if you just have A, it's A. If you just have clumping with B, then it's B. Coombs test will tell you if it's positive or negative. So hemagglutination and Coombs are a direct test for the antigen because you're looking for the actual antigens on the red blood cell types. So antibodies in the serum are added from the anti-A and the anti-B serum are added to a drop of blood in the well and each well has a different antiserum. 
If it is positive for those antigens, then it will agglutinate. If it is negative, it will not agglutinate. If, so if it is positive for A, it'll clump here. If it's positive for B, it'll clump with the anti-B. And if, it, if it's positive for both anti-A and anti-B, then it's AB. If it's both of these are negative, then it's O. And if for the Coombs test, if it clumps, it's positive for the RH factor. And if it does not clump, it's negative for the RH factor. So if you were, were to read this card right here, what would that be? What type of blood would this be? And if you said O positive, that is correct. And this is a very, very common type of blood. About 40 to 50 percent of the overall population, and that's including like all of the different ethnic groups and ethnicities. Um, so that that's pretty common. So to have R H or to be R H positive, but yet to be O um, have neither A nor B antigens. So passive agglutination is when you have these little beads of latex and you put the antibodies for the suspected antigen on that. And so the latex beads serves as kind of a simulated cell. And it is a direct test also because it will directly test against the culture. So you're mixing these reagents that contain the beads with, and it acts like serum with cells in it. And, but they have antibodies uh, attached to the beads. And so serum, which contains the antibodies against the antigen, which is usually a culture. And if it doesn't clump, that's negative. If it does clump, it's positive. So in this case, it is positive for the antigen. And then what this common test, what we did in the lab was the Bacti staph test. So it was looking for the protein A on the coagulase enzyme, which indicated that you have Staphylococcus aureus. So that is looking for the antigen. This is also looking for the different types of antigens that might be on red blood cells. So other agglutination tests can be done to, to quantify, as they were showing in that video earlier. And they'll do dilution. So like 1 in 20 will be cut in half. So you'll do a 1 in 2 dilution, which makes it a 1 in 40. You do a 1 in 2 of that, and you get 1 in 80. And 1 in 2 of that, and you get a 1 in 60, and so on. And um, so that series of dilutions where you have the last tube that has the this is most dilute solution that has a visible response so that would be this 1 over 160 is the dilution the reciprocal of the dilution is the titer so the titer would be 160 and these others did not react and so this is this is how we count the titer which is the concentration of antibodies um, so you can look at these different plates and you can see the reciprocal of the dilutions here and that's basically giving you the titer so a mat would be agglutinated and just a bead would be not agglutinated. So where you see these flat mats up to like the 32 here, so this A would be a titer of 32. Um, B did not, did not at any of these solutions, did not clump, so it's negative for whatever it was. Um, C is kind of a little difficult to tell because this one should have reacted if these two reacted. So that's that one's probably inconclusive. Um, this one here goes out to 128, so the titer would be 128. So what's the titer of E, F, G, and H? So if you read this correctly, E would be 64, F would be no titer, so it's negative for whatever you're testing for. G would be 16, and H would be 64 also. So not that I'm going to ask you to do that, but that's how the test is read. And um, I think you need to just understand, again, that the titer is the, re is the reciprocal of the serum dilution. So precipitation reactions, you have soluble antigen that's made insoluble when it clumps together with antibodies, when you have an equal amount of antigen antibody, they form a visible precipitate. 
And so it's observable in um, solutions, uh, sometimes the auger in this test here, which is called the Octorlani. You have auger and then they stamp in, they, they use a stamp to create wells and they put the antigen in one uh, control antibody in another so you know you have a positive test there and then test serum one and test serum two and so out of this test if you were to read this test then test serum two had antibodies for the antigen and so here you see number two must be the control well because it's got the two lines um, and then you can see number four and number one are creating a positive result for that and so those are positive as well but six five and three appear not to have a, a, a precipitate so that is observable when the antiserum is carefully laid over the antigen and in the tube gluten agglutination test you have to do it carefully because otherwise they would mix and you want to have like a barrier between the antigen and antibody and when you get this um, equal amount of antigen antibody they will create that precipitate that's visible. So immunochromatography also called the lateral flow test is what you typically find in a drugstore pregnancy test and rapid strep and now COVID tests that they do in a doctor's office or at the pharmacy um, at least for the COVID it's something you can do at the pharmacy or you can get a home test and uh, they basically have these little plastic cartridges with a little paper in the middle that's been embedded with some antibodies or antigens and then you have your sample well that either is a drop or a swab or something like that most most likely this is going to be the swab is going to be dipped into some solution and the solution is going to squeeze out whatever antigen is on the swab into the liquid and then you're going to put like three to six drops on this well and then it's going to flow past and you get the um, T line if you have a positive and then the C line with the control tells you that you did the test correctly and this is pretty common and all the different there's all different kinds of COVID tests out there so we we should know lateral flow tests very well if you've ever done any of the at-home tests. Um, the Binox is a little different than this but it still has the same basic principle. Uh, titer again is the concentration of antibodies in a sample and it is determined by the serial dilutions of the patient serum into test tubes or wells on a micro titer plate with equal amounts of antigen and so the highest dilution of the serum that still produces an agglutination, a visible reaction is titer. So the highest dilution, the most dilute, in other words, the smallest concentration of the antibodies that still clumps together with the antigen uh, would be the titer. The Western blot is is a separation of proteins by their size and charge using a gel and an electrical charge. So you have positive end on one end of the gel and negative on the other end of the gel. Typically proteins are going to be negatively charged so you put them in the negative wells and wells and then they, they go towards the positive end of the gel. So they're distributed through the gel and the gel is thick enough that they can move through it but um, thick enough that they won't allow them all to move very quickly through it. So the bigger they are, the slower that they travel. And then they put a filter with antibody solutions on the gel. The filter picks up the, the, anti, the antigens and they incubate it with antibody solutions, some of them having a radioactive or fluorescent or bioluminescent molecule. And then the antigen, the specific antigen antibody that you're looking for will show up as a band of proteins and can be compared with a positive or negative control. So here you can see there's like a usually a positive negative control at one end and they've identified the particular proteins that they're looking for. Um, they separate out the proteins, then they, they put it on a membrane, some sort of filter, and that picks up the antigens, and then you put this primary antibody that's against that particular target, 
So if that particular target protein was, was separated out, is present, then the antibody will attach to it. And if there are any antibodies, then this anti-IgG antibody, it's a secondary antibody that's against any antibody still present, has a colored tag, or it could be a fluorescence or bioluminescent or something. But something that is a, having a contact signal to allow us to see it. And if all these things are present, and after you wash each time, similar to the ELISA, if they don't get washed away, then they were specific to the thing that they were, they were attached to, what they were supposed to be attached to. And so then you'll get a color, and that's what the, these bands are showing here, is the color. You can also do immunofluorescence, and this also can be done as a direct or indirect test, and you um, have the contact signal as a fluorescent antibody, a secondary antibody or a primary antibody that has something so you can see it under fluorescence um, microscope or something to that effect. So typically they do this with the fluorescent treponema test and they'll put down in the direct test they'll have um, an unknown specimen or antigen is fixed to a slide and exposed to the antigen or to the antibodies that have the fluorescent label to it and in the indirect test they will do um, the opposite they'll put the known antigen which is syphilis and they'll put the patient's serum on there and then they'll do a secondary antibody which has fluorescence to it. But this is very direct and if they're just looking for always for spirochetes then they can have this one antibody that's made for, for spirochetes and if it's present then it glows, if it's not present then when you did the wash it washes away. So again an indirect you're going to put down the known antigen first then you have the test serum, so that's the, the patient's serum, to see if they have been exposed to the antigen. And if they have antibodies against the antigen, then they'll stick. Then they have a secondary fluorescent tagged antibody that's used to visualize it. And that's um, how we know if they're positive or negative. The enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, or ELISA, not ELISA, most people call it ELISA, ELISA, uh, it uses enzyme-linked antibodies that are the indicator of the contact signal and a substrate to give us a color change if the antigens and antibodies are all there. So it relies on a solid support, so a plastic microtiter plate that can absorb, can attach, the, the antibodies can attach to and the antigens can attach to. Um, and there's usually like 96 wells in this plate and you can test many patients and you can detect, you can not only just detect it, which is a quantitative test, but you can also, or qualitative, but you can also detect how much is present by doing dilutions from the patient serum. So in the indirect ELISA, the first thing that you put down the, is the known antigen. So this is true of all of the um, indirect test. You put down the known antigen first, then you add the patient serum, which is the primary antibody, and then you add the, and that, if the patient serum has the antibody, then when you do the wash, it will not wash away. The antibody will stay stuck to the antigen, but anything that did not, any antibodies or anything that's not attached to the antigen will wash away. And then the secondary antibody with the enzyme is added and that binds to the FC portion of the patient's antibody and it's sticking up there waiting for the substrate and then the fourth thing you add is the substrate. So for the test I want you to be able to tell me like what are the things we add and so this little illustration will help you because you've got the antigen, the patient's blood, which is the primary antibody. If the patient's blood has the antibody in it, then that would attach to the antigen. And then the secondary antibody is made for any antibodies that may still be present even after you've washed it. If you do the washing, it should wash away anything that does not stick and that's not specific. And then the fourth thing that you add is this colorless substrate which reacts with the enzyme and becomes colored and so then you have a color change. 
So next we're going to do a little animation of ELISA and compare the direct and indirect ELISA.